In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated and good morning. It was a year ago today that we had a lot of snow on Sunday morning. You might remember it. It was uh, not the Sunday we had to call off. It was another Sunday. And there were six people here at church. And they were all from Minnesota and Wisconsin. (laughs) Except for two Southerners. One from Alabama and one from the great state of Louisiana. But we all... we. We had Eucharist and we went home. It was about a 20 minute service and there was no sermon. So I saved that for today and I'm going to preach two sermons. (laughs) It's good to be with you today, especially when it's kind of gray and cold and everything. I have good news. I always have good news, but I especially have good news today. And I'm going to start with Big Punch. We have a parishioner named Kathy Hay, who died a couple years ago, and she left St. Martin's, portions of her estate, and we just got the latest installment, which is a tail end of her gifts, for $250,000. So I'm going to let that sink in for a moment, and I hope that in our hearts and minds we can give thanks to Kathy and to God, for God's abundance to her and for her abundance and return of thanksgiving to her congregation. So, that's the first big punch. Now, I want to talk about pledges. (laughs) And I want to say three things about pledges. I met with the uh, stewardship, some of the members of the stewardship committee yesterday, and it was my opportunity to see some some names and households and lists, basically, uh, before I leave town later today for a couple weeks. And um, I want to thank you all for your faithfulness and all those pledging units for 2015, for all your support, of course, in the past. Uh, For those of you who are new, and maybe this is your first Sunday, we don't talk about money every week. But I love to talk about stewardship because it's a spiritually-based part of our ministry and our call, and I'll say more about that as I preach my two sermons today. But if you're new, I want to invite you to start making a pledge to St. Martin's, and I want to invite you to to enter into a deeper relationship with God, and whatever that looks like for you, I don't know what people pledge, I just know if they pledge or not. And so I encourage everybody to participate in the life of the congregation. The vestry has a meeting coming up in a couple of weeks where they set, finally set the budget for the rest of the year, for 2015. That meeting will be on the 25th, and it's nice for us, it's necessary for us to have the most updated numbers as possible. That's part of the reason I'm mentioning it now. But it all has to do with our gospel text, and I'll bring that all together towards the end. So I want to say thank you for all those who have pledged already, a large number of people, and we need everybody's pledge. We also uh, want to invite people to start pledging and to have conversations with people who are on the stewardship committee or clergy. You're welcome to talk with me uh, about that. Uh, Jeff Cleavy is in the choir with his hand raised up, is one of our stewardship people. And uh, Kevin Clark on the other end of the congregation. They're my wingmen, you see, on the right and left. And we have other people, the Reeves and other wonderful people, uh, Kay Fletcher over there, all part of the stewardship committee, and they can point you to pledge cards and that process if that's new for you. I understand that people come from all different directions on this, but we want to be on the same page together as God's congregation of St. Martin's. So I invite you to have that deeper conversation. If for some reason that you haven't pledged yet for 2015, I want to invite you to do that too. I want to invite you to resume your pledge, whether that's resuming your pledge from last year or the year before, because the vestry will be able to put those funds that we've been given by Kathy Hay, this is how it all kind of ties together, it does tie together, and we'll be able to put those investments and multiply what God has already given us. That's part of our good stewardship, but the vestry has to have the most accurate numbers, the most up-to-date numbers as possible in order to set that operating budget for this year. 
The other thing that that makes a difference is our capacity. This church does a lot of outreach within the outreach committee and just all different areas of the church. And we want to, of course, be faithful to God as God has been faithful to us and to increase the amount of outreach and the different ministries that we're involved in. So the stronger base we can build, the more we can do that all the way around. So I encourage you to, again, uh, whatever, wherever you fall in any of those three areas of uh, already pledged or new uh, to this church or uh, somebody who's in a position to resume their pledge, that you would have that conversation and let us know. Fill out a card, let one of the stewardship committee members know so they can relay that information to the vestry. Part of our gospel text today from Luke has this wonderful section of Jesus being 12 years old. It's the only place that we hear anything about Jesus in that stage of his life. We don't hear anything about him again, for instance, for another 18 years until he's 30 years old. But in this account from Luke, Jesus travels with his family, and evidently there's a whole group, and they go for the Passover festival. Jesus stays in the temple, and a key golden thread through Luke from the beginning, even before the second chapter, right from the beginning of Luke and then towards the end of Luke, and then at the very end of Luke, takes place in the temple. And that's important for us to see those different threads in here. So there's the portion from the very beginning of Luke where uh, Zechariah and uh, Simeon and Anna are all involved in, in that. There's John coming and, and so forth. And then Jesus is born and uh, there's a trip to the temple here again when Jesus is 12. And Jesus says something in two places in all of Luke's gospel. And I want to point these out because one of them is in this passage that we have today. And that is when his parents return, they're alarmed, of course, when they discover at the end of the day that he's not in the group. And they go back to Jerusalem and they find him in the temple. And he's been there for three days in the midst of teaching in his father's house. His mother is kind of anxious, of course, and her voice uh, has the tone of accusation, and she says, how could you have done this to us? How could you have done this to us? But Jesus' calm response is in contrast to that. Her response, or her, her accusation, if you will, is only natural. Any parent, we all would do something like that. But his response is in contrast to that. And it says something intentionally about who he is and who he's going to be. And Luke says here that Jesus responds with, I have been busying myself with my father's work. I have been busying myself with my father's work. And then we have this wonderful part, and depending on which translation you read, ours today read, Mary treasured these things in her heart. Other versions read, Mary ponders these things. And you might think of another place where Mary ponders the reality that was her son and the son of God. She ponders, she treasures. Jesus has been busy with his father's work. As Christians, as disciples, and living in the image of Christ, we are constantly finding that golden thread through our lives of being about our Father's work. And that's how all three of these areas that I've mentioned today, the gift, the stewardship, the challenge of the vestry, uh, the charge of the vestry, to honor that and this church and God, our pledges, responding to God out of the thankfulness of our heart, making that concrete so the church can move forward. And also this wonderful business about being Christians and what it means for us to be alive in Christ and to live a life full of witness about our Father's work. As Christians, our life really begins. Our life really begins when we begin to respond to God's call in our life. 
From this snapshot of Jesus' life when he's 12, we get that sense that he is about his father's work. He is alive and responding to God's call in his life. And I would encourage all of us, whatever has transpired in our life, whatever we're dealing with, to find ways to be generous, to find ways to lead and live, live a generous life. We have so many things, so many opportunities to do that. So I encourage you to be creative, whatever your circumstances, to find ways to lead a generous life. A very wise person once said, there's only one death for Christians, and as resurrection people, we know that that's not with our last breath. But this person said there's only one death that a person could possibly experience, and that is dying by inches, inch by inch, from leading a mean, living a mean existence. Death, inch by inch. So I encourage us to find ways to be generous. That doesn't mean we sugarcoat anything, just the opposite. We find ways, especially in the midst of whatever we're going through, the peaks and the valleys, to be generous. So Jesus gives us that snapshot of what it means to be alive and be about his father's work. And then we remember, as Jesus was about his father's work, that Luke brings this, these very same words one other place and it's in the 24th chapter of Luke when the two disciples, we don't really know their sex or their name or anything, but they're on the road to Emmaus, and it doesn't matter because it could be us. They're on the road to Emmaus. They're grieving three days again, lost their Jesus for three days. That sounds like a good song, country song, title, or maybe a gospel song. I've lost Jesus. But we do that. We have times in our lives where we lose we feel like at least we've lost Jesus. And like the couple on the road to Emmaus, they hear these words. They're able to see a glimpse of the bigger picture that Jesus never really left them. He was about his father's work. And that's our call as Christians, is to find ways to be about our father's work. The other thing I'll say about that, and just like these examples with Mary and Joseph and with the couple on the road to Emmaus, and really throughout all of the Gospels with all of the disciples, that discipleship will inevitably involve dealing with unexpected things from God. Unexpected things in our life and certainly unexpected things from God. We do know from Luke's Gospel as it started in the temple with Zechariah's vision, Simeon and Anna, and then Jesus as a 12-year-old, and then Jesus meeting the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We know that the temple theme is carried through through the end of Luke because at the very end of the gospel, the disciples are praising God in the temple. We may think of the temple as a physical place, and indeed there is an aspect of that where it happens within these walls on this church campus. But Paul also uses language as he writes the early church, and I think it's the good for us, for our hearts to take this posture and for us to heed this, that the temple is our body and where we are. In a sense, we are satellite temples, satellite locations for being about our Father's work, for the good news in the world. In this Christmas season, knowing that Epiphany is only two days away, and Tuesday evening, but not quite here, we have the opportunity to say, in the midst of our busyness with Christmas, to take a deep breath in, and if we have, any of us, felt like we have lost Jesus, to seek for Jesus again. To see Jesus in the breaking of the bread, like the couple on the road to Emmaus who finally recognize Jesus in the sacrament of communion and that we would also seek like Mary and Joseph and ponder and treasure these things in our heart that Jesus is about the work of God and so shall we be. Thanks be to God. Amen.